Hello, friends. I discovered something just now. Uh, I was looking for more strange stories to read, and I found one from uh, Isaacs15, who did the the fantastical Sonichu Club story. Turns out they had done another one. This is Heart of Dorkness. <laughs> Which is, of course, based on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And, let's see. Yeah, okay, they described it right here. Uh, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and Isaac Kernan. I hope I said that right. Based on Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Coppola's Apocalypse Now, and the life of Christian Weston Chandler. <laughs> so, you know, here we go. <laughs> Richmond. God, I was still only in Richmond. My hotel room was dark with thick plumes of cigarette smoke still hanging in the air. The doors were blaring over the radio as I struggled to stay awake. I don't consider myself a hero by any means, but I feel like I must get this story off my chest, as it were. I don't want to bother you much with what happened to me personally, yet to understand the effect of it on me, you ought to know how I got out there. What I saw, how I went up that road to that place where I met the devil himself. It was the farthest point of navigation and the culminating point of my experience. It seemed somehow to throw a kind of light on everything about me and into my thoughts. It was somber enough, too. You see, I work for a comics publisher, the biggest publisher in the biz. I was just an inker, glorified tracer, but I had been talented enough to receive an audience with the head of our company, and he gave me an important assignment. It seemed our number one artist and best source of creative writing had become stressed. It was my understanding that this fellow had hundreds of pages of comic work ready to go, but no means to transport it back to HQ. I had a vacation coming up, so the company head thought it'd be best to send me out to Ruckersville and see if I could pick up what was sure to be the artist's magnum opus. I'm sorry to say that I accepted this assignment. This was already a fresh departure for me. I was not used to get things this way, you know. I always went my own road, my own legs, had a mind where to go. I wouldn't have believed it myself, but then, you see, I felt somehow I must get there by hook or by crook. So I looked around for any means of transport. The men said, fuck off. Then, would you believe it? I tried the women. I, Clyde Cash, set the women to work. To get a car. Jesus. Anyway, I got my car. A 1994 Ford Escort, fresh from the police auction. Seen the car was utilized as a murder weapon some years ago. Run down some poor bastard named Michael Snyder. Before I left, I was called into the company headquarters for a physical. Apparently another fellow working for our publishers had met a grisly end, and so now it was mandatory for a physical before each assignment in order to help better identify the uh, bodies. Leary. Alec Benson Leary. That was the fellow's name who got himself 86th. Never did find out why, though. The old doctor felt my pulse, evidently thinking of something else, all the while. Good, good for Rockersville, he mumbled, and then with a certain eagerness asked me whether I would let him measure my head. Rather surprised, I said yes. When he produced a thing like calipers and got the dimensions back and front and every which way, taking notes carefully, he was an unshaven little man in a threadbare coat, his feet in slippers. And I thought him a harmless fool. I always ask in the interest of science to measure the crania of those going out there, he said. And when they come back too, I asked. He did not reply, but he looked away from me. This was a sign of things to come. I stepped into my newly purchased escort at 6 a.m. the next morning with Ruckertville in mind. It was a short 90-minute ride from Richmond to Ruckersville, but little did I know the road had chosen would lead me into the darkest recesses of the human soul. As I prepared to leave, a gentleman from our company approached me, smoking a long cigar. I say the fellow was impeccably dressed in a white leisure suit. 
Cash, he said. Good to meet you. He shook my hand and invited me to his hotel room. It was the one next to mine. Once inside, he began to speak. Sooner or later, he began. You are sure to encounter Mr. Chandler. On my asking who Chandler was, he said that he was the man who I was to find. And seeing my disappointment at this information, he added slowly, He's a very remarkable person. Further questions elicited from him that Mr. Chandler's artistic talents outweighed anyone else's at our company, and his seizure had plunged our company into chaos. It was very important that no matter what, I bring him back alive. He showed me to the door and set me on my way. The road to Ruckersville was long and hard. Along the way, I witnessed gang war between Crips and Bloods. They were fighting over a piece of property one of them had been given by a mysterious benefactor. Of note, the item in question boasted the letter CWC, in Boston Gold. The Crip who claimed ownership had a tattoo of the same CWC on his forehead. Curious? I was almost killed by a bleeding cannibal hitchhiker, who only failed to feast upon me when I kicked the car door open and threw him from the vehicle. I stopped at a gas station for breakfast and found something rather interesting. An issue of Sonichu Zero by Christian Weston Chandler. Was this the same Chandler that I was supposed to find somewhere up the road? The book was published by my company. I bought it, read through it. It was a relatively innocent story about a fusion of Sonic and Pokemon franchises. Indeed, this Chandler was a talented man. I read his bio in the back of the book, born and raised in Virginia, long sufferer of online trolling, a fascinating bio to be sure. Hungry for more, I picked up Sonichu issue 8 off the same rack. Sonichu 8 was a horrific perversion of all that was set up in Zero. While the cover advertised a Sonichu Spring Break special, in actuality it featured Sonichu and Rose Chu visiting Four Cent Garbage World Headquarters to battle the evil Jason Kendrick Howell. Of note, I really met a Jason Kendrick Howell at work several months prior. He had since vanished mysteriously. The Four Cent Garbage Headquarters was comprised of a hellish array of pornographic pictures, racial slurs, mind-bending terror. The issue ended with a sickening sexual display of Sonichu and Rose Chu having horrendously disturbing sexual relations. Something had happened to Mr. Chandler while out in Ruckersville, of that I was sure. When I finally arrived at Ruckersville, the town was bizarrely empty. All the citizens were clustered in small groups, talking amongst themselves. But there was no hustle, no bustle. I counted maybe 30 or 40 citizens total. Something horrible had happened here. And then I saw it. 14 Branchland Court, Chandler's residence. I saw the slope of the hill interspaced with rare trees and perfectly free from undergrowth. A long, decaying building on the summit was half buried by high grass. Large holes in the peaked roof gaped black from afar. The jungle in the woods made the background. There was no enclosure or fence of any kind, but there had been one apparently for near the house half a dozen slim posts remained in a row, roughly trimmed, and with their upper ends ornamented with round carved balls. Outside the house he stood, Jason Kendrick Howell. I looked at him, lost in astonishment. There he was, before me, in Motley. As I thought he had absconded from the troop of mimes, enthusiastic, fabulous. His very existence was improbable, inexplainable, and altogether bewildering. I looked at him, and then beyond. It seemed Chandler's residence had become overgrown with wildlife. Flora and fauna choked that diseased cesspool of human misery. He spoke. He's up there. Chandler? He nodded and spoke again. He had, as he informed me proudly, managed to nurse Chandler through two illnesses. He alluded to it as, you would say, some risky feat. But as a rule, Chandler wandered alone, far into the depths of Ruckersville. Very often coming to this house, I had to wait days and days before he would turn up, he said. Oh, well, it was worth waiting for, some sometimes. What was he doing? Exploring, or what? Oh yes, of course, 
he had discovered lots of people, a lake too. He did not know exactly in what direction. It was dangerous to inquire too much, but mostly his expeditions had been for comic inspiration. To speak plainly, he raided the county, I said. He nodded. Not alone, surely. He muttered something about the surrounding towns. Chandler got all of Ruckersville to follow him, didn't he? I asked. He fidgeted a little. They adored him, he said. The tone of these words was so extraordinary that I looked at him searchingly. It was curious to see his mingled eagerness and reluctance to speak of Mr. Chandler. The man filled his life, occupied his thoughts, swayed his emotions. What can you expect? he burst out. He came to them with thunder and lightning, you know. They had never seen anything like it. And very terrible. He could be very terrible. You can't judge Mr. Chandler as you would an ordinary man. No, no. Now, just to give you an idea, I don't mind telling you. He wanted to shoot me too one day, but I don't judge him. They want you to take him. They'll try to kill you. I was bewildered at how quickly he had changed topics. I tell you, the man, he's enlarged my mind. I'm a small man, a dumb man, compare me to... He was trying to make a point. I'm not sure I get his point, even today. He was an insoluble problem. It was inconceivable how he existed, how he had succeeded in getting so far, how he had managed to remain... Why did he not instantly disappear? I went a little farther, he said. Then still a little farther. I had gone so far that I don't know how I'll ever get back. Never mind. Plenty of time. I can manage. You take Chandler away. Quick, quick, I tell you. Then I heard it. A voice. His voice. The voice. It rang deep to the very last... It survived his strength to hide his magnificent folds of eloquence in the barren darkness of his heart. I ran towards the house to hear him clearer, then I saw my mistake. Those round knobs were not ornamental, but symbolic. They were expressive and puzzling, striking and disturbing, food for thought, and also for vultures if there had been any looking down from the sky. But, at all events, for such ants were... Industry enough to ascend the pole. They would have been even more impressive, those heads on stakes, if their faces had not been turned to the house. Only one, the first one I had made out, was facing my direction. I had expected to see a knob of wood there, you know. I returned deliberately to the first I had seen, and there it was, black, dried, sunken with closed eyelids, a head that seemed to sleep at the top of the pole, and with shrunken dry lips, showing a narrow white line of teeth. It was smiling, too, smiling continuously at some endless and joyous dream of that eternal slumber. I stepped back cautiously. What the hell was this? And the voice spoke again. A captain's log. Start at July 7th, 2014. What was he babbling about? The door to his hovel slammed open, and out he struggled. Oh, he struggled. He struggled. The wastes of his weary brain were haunted by the shadowy images now, images of wealth and fame revolving obesely around his unextinguishable gift of noble and lofty expression. He wore a clownish shirt of red and white and blue stripes. His hair was long and greasy. His face, he wore what must have been his mother's makeup. I knew he was 32 from the bio in the back of Sonichu Zero, but in outward appearance, he looked at least 47. My name is Chris Omasa Chandler. I'm 32 years old from Rockville, Virginia. He said this twice. My name is Christian. Mr. Chandler, my name is Clyde Cash. I'm here from... He cut me off. You know, I, I watched uh, my cargo crawl along the outsides of my Pokeball. This was my dream, my nightmare. He gestured to his surroundings. I came here to write a book, you know. I knew. He was far gone. The freedoms he had experienced in this town had spoiled him, ruined him. 
Sir, get in the car. We, we really need to go. Are you an assassin? This question caught me off guard. No, I'm a comic book inker. You're neither. You're just a jerk who came to steal all the pretty girls. Because of people like you, Virginia is for virgins. With this, he swung at me. I ducked out of the way, narrowly avoiding the corpse of some poor child he had murdered on a whim. He pulled a pocket knife from his pocket. Doing dramatic glasses removal, he stepped towards me. My name is Christian Wilson Chandler, he said. Not Ian Brennan something! He lunged at me with the knife. I caught the knife as he thrust it and redirected it, stabbing him in the gut. I half-dragged, half-carried Chandler back to the car. I had found his manuscript for Sonichu 10, loaded into the car first. He was still alive for the time being, but the knife wound, as well as his severe illness, had reduced him to a near-death state. I had immense plans, he muttered resolutely as I drove. I was I was on the threshold of great things. He pleaded in a voice of longing with wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. I tried to break the spell, the heavy mute spell of this town that seemed to draw him into its pitiless breast by the awakening of forgotten and brutal instincts, by the memory of gratified and monstrous passions. This alone, I was convinced... I had driven him to the edge of humanity, to redneck country, towards the gleam of fires, the throb of drums, the drone of weird incantations. This alone had beguiled his unlawful soul beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations. And you see, don't you see? The terror of this position was not in being knocked on the head, though I had a very lively sense of that danger too. But in this, that I had to deal with a being whom I could not appeal in the name of anything high or low. There was nothing, either above or below him, and I knew it. He had kicked himself loose of the earth. Confound the man, he had kicked the very earth to pieces. He was alone, and I, before him, did not know whether I stood on the ground or floated in the air. I had been telling you what we said, repeating the phrases we pronounced. But what was the good? They were common everyday words, the familiar, the vague sounds exchanged in every waking day of life. But what of that? They had behind them, to my mind, the terrific suggestiveness of words heard in dreams, phrases spoken in nightmares. He kept looking past me with fiery, longing eyes, with a mingled expression of wistfulness and hate. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as you peer down at a man who is lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. Anything approaching the change that came over his features I have never seen before and hope never to see again. Oh, I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent. I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, ruthless power, craven terror, intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper at some image, some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath. The humor. The humor. He was dead. This man who I had been charged to protect, I had killed. I looked through his manuscript. It was mostly self-insertion nonsense as, I came to realize, was most of his work. The final page was blank with only the words, Exterminate the Trolls, written in almost incomprehensible cursive. I can no longer go a day in my life without thinking of Sonichu, of Ruckersville, of my encounter with death, knowing that deep down Chandler and I had been cut from the same cloth. But his final words shake me to this day, and I must laugh from the humor. The humor. That was surprisingly deep, and I very much enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. It's so weird putting Chris Chan stuff into like actual, like real accredited fiction, and somehow it still works. I don't know why that is, but God. Isaac's 15 has not published anything since, uh, let me check the latest date. 
Um, yeah, 2014. Uh, 2014 was the last time, which I hope, I hope you know, wherever you are, Isaac's 15, that this was incredible. I, I am super impressed with this, and I very much enjoyed it, and I hope you guys enjoyed it too. This is, this is very strange and interesting, but that's the end of this episode. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I've said that about six times, but, you know, if you did, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you would, please check out the Ko-Fi and the merch store. There we go. Uh, those are the things that keep the lights on in here more than anything else, I'll be honest with you. And if you have a story you would like to send me, send it to r slash moonhorse stories, and I will definitely check it out. I love you all so very much, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.